Morning, everybody. Uh, Paul Trainer is my name. I'm an advanced paramedic National Ambulance Service based in Cork City and with the Emergency Air Medical Service in Athlone. I also um, operate as an off-duty responder, so I'm well used to working as a, a CFR as well. Um, you'll have to forgive me, uh, no, through no fault of the lads, but my notes um, aren't working, so I'm going to have to, to wing it a little bit. So I'm here to talk to you about pit crew CPR. So I'm not going to be able to teach you how to do pit crew CPR today, but I want you to leave here with the concept in your mind of we might be able to do things a little bit differently. Hopefully what I'm saying here now will tie in with what Owen was talking about a minute ago. Um, we're doing things good, we could do things a lot better. So who can perform pit crew CPR? Everybody in this room who's operating as a responder at whatever level can take part and do pit crew CPR as part of a team. It just takes practice, practice, more practice and more practice. Way more practice than you've been doing already. I'm not here for a minute to say that what you've been doing up to now is not good. It obviously is. It's getting, it's getting results. What we can get, as uh, Professor Galvin was saying, we can get better results. We can do things differently. We can think about what we're doing. We can debrief them um, and, and learn from each other's experiences. So everybody can do pick through CPR. The good news is it doesn't cost a cent. I know, obviously, everybody's trying to fundraise and get defibs and boxes and jackets and keep phones topped up. CPU, C, uh, pit crew CPR doesn't cost anything. It just takes time. It takes a good bit of time and it takes lots of practice. A lot of the articles that have been written about pit crew CPR describe it as choreographed chaos. Um, you'll find that term chaos used a lot in some of the papers and some of the articles about uh, cardiac arrest. Um, I'm in the ambulance service 15 years. When I started, I would say that cardiac arrests in this country were chaotic. They were completely chaotic. It's not fair to use the word chaos now, so I just put that up there. So I, I put that slide up and took it down a few times, but cardiac arrests in Ireland, thanks to lots of different things, the control centre, identifying cardiac arrests and doing um, telephone CPR, everybody in this room, CFR groups, upskilling of the ambulance service, new equipment, cardiac arrests are not chaotic. They are very stressful. There's lots going on. There's adrenaline flowing, not, not only through our um, syringes, but through people's, through people's bodies. You have family members. You have lots of different factors. You have an environment that you may not be able to control, but we're going to talk a little bit about that later. Um, they're getting, uh, chaos is not a word that we're going to use anymore. They're, uh, we're, they're much more orderly, but pick through CPR can bring even more order to that again. Um, I need you to open your minds a little bit just for a second, I'm not saying that you're not open-minded. I want to show you what ordinary CPR, ordinary good CPR is. It does the job, it does exactly, as Ronsian said, it does exactly as it says on the tin. And then I want to show you what pit crew CPR can do. So we can do a play button on this. So this, this is ordinary, this is good quality ordinary CPR here now. Yeah. Which one? Sorry, folks, computers. Okay, we have to use our um, imagination. That first guy is changing a tire on a car. It's perfectly acceptable. He puts in a jack, he winds it up, he unscrews the, the bolts, he takes the wheel off, he puts another wheel on, he screws them, and he puts it back down. That's ordinary CPR. It does, it said it does exactly what it says in the tin. If this video had to work, it would show you the um, Mercedes pit crew team that have won the last two world championships with uh, Lewis Hamilton. Everybody has a role. Everybody knows exactly what they're doing. Nobody is distracted. They practice and practice and practice, and they have this, they, they're doing the same work that the first guy is doing four times, as fa four times over, in other words, they're changing four tires in a fraction of the time. And we need, as practitioners and as responders, we need to be that slick. We need to be able to go out, do CPR, with, uh, as a pit crew, as a, as a, same as a Formula One team would. Basic life support is the cornerstone of everything that you're going to do. We all, we're all familiar, everyone's familiar with the um, chain of survival. That's, I don't need to go into that. There's a new term that I hope you're all going to start using going into the future. There's two, two versions of it. Um, the first that we're using here is the BLS triangle, or in the, in the States, they're calling it the triangle of life, which I think is a little bit more catchier, kind of grabs people's attention. Um, at, the, at the center of everything that we do is the patient. So the patient is going to be at the center of our BLS triangle. Okay, so the triangle is made up of three sides. The first three responders are the most important. They, they set the foundation for everything that happens after that. 
Um, the first couple of minutes, you, you, you've all seen that of a cardiac arrest, are crucial. That's where it all happens. If we can get 360 degree access like we have around this guy, that's, that's super. We don't want to have patients up against the wall. We need to control our environment. Don't let the environment control you. That's the first thing. Second responder is, is making the, the next link. So you'll see in a minute in, in a, a, a draft CPG that all of these people have, um, have a certain role when they get there. So the first person in the door is doing one particular role, the second person doing another, third is doing airway. It doesn't matter, you, everyone needs to train and it be interchangeable. And when you walk in the door, if you want to practice it through CPR, you need to be able to walk in the door and know exactly what your role is. You don't need to get distracted by what the next person is doing and the next person is doing. They're going to know what they're doing. The next cardiac arrest, you might, be, you might be the first person in the door on one, the next one you might be the third person in the door. You need to, they could be 24 hours apart, or they could be 48 days apart. You need to be totally focused on um, what your role is going to be. That's what, that's what a pit crew CPR looks like with six providers. But the most important three, I don't want you to get too distracted by the people on the outside of the triangle, the most important is the BLS triangle, that that's intact. Um, and that the BLS is, is exceptionally high quality. The leader, which is a, a P4 here, will be staying outside of the triangle, won't be interfering with the BLS, but will be keeping an overview on it. And the other two people are, are um, support. I wasn't too sure whether there was many people practicing um, pit through CPR uh, until this week when I attended two cardiac arrests. Two very different cardiac arrests. Uh, one of them was entirely made up of practitioners and it, it, it went fine, it was the guy changing his, his wheel, it was okay, everything went as it should, but it wasn't as slick as it could have been. I went out to a cardiac arrest last Thursday, which was made up almost exclusively of CFRs, certainly the CFRs were first on scene, and when I walked in the door, this is exactly the setup that was going on. There was, it was four CFRs, an AP and a paramedic, and they had a six-person pit crew CPR model set up unknown to themselves. So we're all doing this, we just need to practice it and do it a little bit better. This is, this is the key to pit crew, is communication and feedback. Feedback, there's a skill in giving feedback. You can't, um, you, if you give feedback in the wrong way, it ends up being taken as criticism. And you can't, if, it's, if you start criticizing people, they'll, they'll turn away from it, they won't embrace it, and you know, nobody wants to be criticized for anything. But I think we'd all like to be told if we, were do, if we were doing something good, we could do it a little bit better. This is called the feedback sandwich. So you, you give praise. Now, I, I know I said don't give criticism. That should be, that should be praise, feedback, and, and more praise. So this is a slightly better illustration of it. So, <laughs> so hopefully she, she's realized that she has a nice hat. She might be able to do something with her face. And, uh, but she has a nice top, so she's leaving, she's leaving with a positive, um, and that's what we need to do. Obviously, we're not, when we're at a cardiac arrest, we're not going to be commenting on people's fashion sense. But if somebody is doing, like as Owen was mentioning earlier, um, compressions, recoil, uh, another thing is not overventilating the patient. If somebody is overventilating the patient, we need to be able to tell them that, okay, you're, you have a good uh, seal on the face mask, but you might need to slow down the breaths a little bit, and well done, you still have a full cylinder of oxygen, or what, you know, that type of a thing. So you, you, you put your feedback in the middle of, of, of praise, and that's very important, and it takes as much practice to give good feedback as it does to do good pick through CPR. So the, the technicality bits, you can train on, but the, the, the feedback, that's the bit where, that's where it's going to be, you're going to make or break. We're all in this for the patient. I've said that already. Uh, pick through CPR is not a magic bullet. There will be patients who will not survive their cardiac arrest, and we need to be, we need to have a realistic expectation as to what's going to, what the outcome is going to be. But with everybody practicing, keeping the chain of survival intact, practicing the BLS triangle with pick through CPR, witness cardiac arrest in the shock of a rhythm, we should assume and expect to have a successful resuscitation. If we go in there with the attitude that, uh, sure, you know. Hopefully, we get, no, you need to go in there with the attitude that we are going to get this patient who's in a shock of rhythm back. We're going to be a, a tight, organized team, and we're going to do it, and we're going to do it well, and we're going to provide each other with feedback. We want to see lots more of these, and we'll be delighted to, to see a speaker later who was um, a survivor of cardiac arrest. There's lots of success stories, but we can do much. Professor Galvin said there's a, lot, there's a lot more that we can do on that. I believe the pick through CPR is one of the ways. It's not, it's not the the answer to all, of, all the cardiac arrest problems, but it, it's certainly one of them. 
And if I can leave that slide up while I exit stage right, if you just keep that in mind. Teamwork, communication, smooth transitions from one compressor to the next, and mutual respect. Provide feedback, don't criticize. If you get feedback, don't take it as criticism. And we can all work together as a team. Thank you.